My talk this morning is titled Fear of Democracy. The latest Israeli elections of the past few weeks are seen in the Western press and among some Western politicians as the latest confirmation that Israeli society is becoming less democratic and more racist and chauvinistic, which we are told is undermining the universal democracy that existed in the Jewish state. The New York Times reported in the wake of the elections, and I quote, that to the left, Israeli democracy is on the defensive. To the ethno-nationalist right, which succeeded last year in enshrining Israel's self-definition as the nation state of the Jews in a basic law, it is in need of an adjustment, unquote. Indeed, the July 2018 passing of Israel's nation state law has been depicted by some in the Western liberal press as ushering the country into a new realm of legal racism unknown before. The general celebratory line in Israel and among its Western supporters since its establishment in 1948 that the country has been able to balance its two important ideals and core principles, namely that it is a Jewish and presumably a universally democratic state, has shifted recently among some to lamenting that it is this balance that was offset by the recent right-wing tilt in the country and which made the nation-state law possible, thus abandoning the universal democratic identity of Israel and strengthening its exclusivist Jewish one. These disconcerting conclusions seem more than unjustified by the recent developments and are more akin to hyperbolic speculations that are not based in fact, let alone in the actual juridical and institutional history of Israel. In order to offer a more accurate assessment, we need to examine the Zionist movements and the Israeli state's historical commitment to the two parts of this definition, namely the claim of the Jewishness of the state and the claim of its universally democratic nature, as well as the history of its claims and plans on, of what to do with the Palestinian population in its state to be. This will enable us to determine if these developments have altered, these recent developments, have altered the nature and commitments of the Jewish state. I will start with the early Jewish colonial settlers who belonged to the proto-Zionist organization Hovavitzion, or Lovers of Zion, and who arrived in Palestine in the early 1880s. Having acquired Palestinian land purchased for them by Baron Edmund James de Rothschild and Kalonimus Vizotsky, the Jewish colonists set on to expel the Palestinian peasants off the land that they had purchased, as their purpose was not to establish universal democratic agricultural or socialist settlements, as is often claimed, but to establish exclusive Jewish colonies. Theodore Herzl the father of Zionism devised plans on what to do with the Palestinian native population once the Jewish colonial settler project was launched. In his 1896 foundational pamphlet, Der Judenstaat, or the State of the Jews, he cautioned against any universal democratic commitments and advised, and I quote him, that an infiltration of Jews is bound to end badly. It continues till the inevitable moment when the native population feels itself threatened and forces the government to stop further influx of Jews. Immigration, he continued, is consequently futile unless we have the sovereign right to continue such immigration." End of quote. In his private diaries, Herzl had more elaborate plans of how universal democracy can be avoided in a future Jewish state in favor of racial and religious exclusivism. The Jewish colonists, he wrote, should, quote, try to spirit the penniless population across the border by procuring employment for it in the transit countries while denying it any employment in our own country. The property owners will come over to our side. Both the processes of expropriation and the removal of the poor must be carried out discreetly and circumspectly. Let the owners of immovable property believe that they are cheating us selling us things for more than they are worth, but we are not going to sell them anything back." Unquote. As Jewish colonies multiplied, so did the expulsion of the Palestinians, so much so that Polish agronomist and colonist Chaim Kalvariski 
a manager of the Jewish Colonization Association, as it was called, reported in 1920 that as someone who had been actively dispossessing the Palestinians since the 1890s, and I quote him, the question of the Arabs first appeared to me in all its seriousness immediately after the first purchase of land I made here. I had to dispossess the Arab residents of their land for the purpose of settling our brothers, unquote. Kalvariski complained that the doleful dirge, as he put it, of those he was forcing off their land, and I quote him again, this doleful dirge did not stop ringing in my ears for a long time thereafter. Yet he would, uh, he would tell the Zionist Provisional Assembly that he had no choice but to expel the Palestinians because, and I, and I quote him again, the Jewish public demanded it, unquote. Although these expulsions that followed Zionist acquisition of the land were legal under Ottoman law, the British occupation set up a new legal regime of expulsion soon after its conquest. Zionism's chauvinism and fear of democracy was so strong that after the First World War, the British, concerned with overextending themselves, entertained the possibility of asking the United States to assume a part of the responsibility for Palestine. The World Zionist Organization, or the WZO, then based in London and entrusted with the creation of a Jewish settler colony in Palestine, objected vehemently and immediately to US involvement, fearing that democracy might be imposed in Palestine. It published the following statement in response. Let me quote it at length. Democracy in America too commonly means majority rule without regards to diversity of types or stages of civilization or differences of quality. Democracy in that sense has been called the melting pot in which the, the quantitatively um, in, in terms of the quantitatively lesser is assimilated into the, the qualitatively lesser is assimilated into the quantitatively greater. This doubtless is natural in America and works on the whole very well. But if the American idea were applied as an American administration might apply it to Palestine, what would happen? The numerical majority in Palestine today is Arab, not Jewish. Qualitatively, it is a simple fact that the Jews are now predominant in Palestine. And given proper conditions, they will be predominant quantitatively also in a generation or two. But if the crude arithmetical conception of democracy were to be applied now or at some early stage in the future, of, in the future to Palestinian conditions, the majority that would rule would be the Arab majority. And the task of establishing and developing a great Jewish Palestine would be infinitely more difficult." Unquote. The Zionist fear of democracy on racialist and religious grounds was not missed by prominent American Jewish anti-Zionists. Indeed, in the same year as the WZO issued its anti-democratic statement, Julius Kahn, a Jewish congressman from San Francisco, delivered a statement endorsed by about 300 Jewish personalities, both rabbis and laymen, to President Woodrow Wilson, whose administration gave support to the Zionists. The document denounced the Zionists for attempting to segregate Jews and to reverse the historical trend toward emancipation and objected to the creation of a distinctly Jewish state in Palestine as contrary to the principles of democracy, quote unquote. This notwithstanding, Herzl's foundational chauvinism and fear of democracy would percolate through the Zionist movement and would be adopted by his Zionist followers on the right and on the left. On the right, the founder of revisionist Zionism, Vladimir Jabotinsky, who is the ideological father of the Likud uh, party today, argued in 1923 against the Zionist labor left who wanted to dissimulate its plans to expel the Palestinians through trickery, explaining that there was no escape from the formula that Jewish colonization and expulsion of the Palestinians were one and the same process. Let me quote him. Any native people, it's all the same whether they are civilized or savage, views their country as their national home, of which they will always be the complete masters. They will not voluntarily allow not only a new master, but even a new partner. And so it is for the Arabs. Compromisers in our midst attempt to convince us that the Arabs are some kind of fools who can be tricked and who will abandon their birthright to Palestine for cultural and economic gains. 
I flatly reject this assessment of the Palestinian Arabs. They look upon Palestine with the same instinctive love and true fervor that any Aztec looked upon his Mexico or any Sioux looked upon the prairie. This childish fantasy of our Arabophiles comes from some kind of contempt for the Arab people, that this race is a rabble ready to be bribed or sell out their homeland for a railroad network." Unquote. Unlike Herzl, who thought the expulsion process would be carried out gently through the simulation, Jabotinsky's strategy was to expel the Palestinians from their homeland using military force. Brushing aside any ethical concerns, he concluded in 1939 that, quote, there is no choice. The Arabs must make room for the Jews of Eretz Israel. If it was possible to transfer the Baltic peoples, it is also possible to move the Palestinian Arabs, unquote. In the 1920s and 1930s, Zionists debated in detail what they termed the transfer of the Palestinians, a cosmetic word meaning expulsion, but their, conclusions, or their conclusion was inescapable. Concurring with Jabotinsky, David Ben-Gurion, the mainstream leader of the colonial settlers, declared in June 1938, and I quote, I support compulsory transfer. I do not see anything immoral in it, unquote. His statement would follow the policy adopted by the Jewish agency, the main Zionist organ at the time in charge of advancing Jewish colonization of Palestine, which set up its first population transfer committee in November 1937 to strategize the forceful expulsion of the Palestinians. The Zionists set these transfer committees, however, after the British conquerors of Palestine sought to make the Zionist vision a reality when the British issued the Peel Commission report in 1937 during the reinvasion of the country to put down the Palestinians' great anti-colonial colonial revolt launched in 1936. This British government report was the first official British proposal to steal Palestinian land and expel hundreds of thousands of Palestinians. The report called for partitioning the country between the European Jewish colonists and the indigenous Palestinians and proposed the necessity to rob the Palestinians of their land and to expel them in order to effect partition. The report cited as precedent the 1923 Greek and Turkish population exchange, as they put it. The proposed exchange in Palestine would have involved the expulsion of 225,000 Palestinians from the proposed Jewish state and a mere 1,250 Jewish colonists from the proposed Palestinian state. It is after this British official endorsement of mass expulsion and confiscation that David Ben-Gurion confided to his diary, and I quote, the compulsory transfer of the Arabs from the valleys of the proposed Jewish state could give us something which we have never had, even when we stood on our own during the days of the first and second temples, a Galilee almost free of non-Jews. We are being given an opportunity which we never dare to dream, or to dream of in our wildest imagination. This is more than a state, government, and sovereignty. This is a national consolidation in a free homeland. The Jewish agency would set up a second population transfer in 1941 and a third population transfer committee during the Zionist conquest of Palestine in 1948. The head of the WZO, Hayim Weizmann, was open about plans to expel one million Palestinians to Iraq and replace them with five million Polish and other European Jewish colonists. On one occasion, he told his plans to the Soviet ambassador here in London, Ivan Maisky, of Jewish background himself, in the hope of obtaining Soviet support. When Ambassador Maisky expressed surprise about how five million Jews would fit in an area on which only one million Palestinians live, Weizmann replied with a racist argument, not unlike those used against the Jews of Europe during that same period of the late 1930s, early 40s. Namely, as he put it, that the Palestinians, I quote him, the Palestinians' laziness and primitivism turn a flourishing garden into a desert. Give me the land occupied by a million Arabs and I will easily settle five times that number of Jews on it, unquote. The problem, that the Zionists, the problem was that the Zionists were unable to expel all the Palestinians during their 1947 to early 1949 conquest of the country, though they expelled over 90% of them. But a growing, sizable minority of Palestinians remained. In 
which necessitated legal and institutional tools to prevent them from being equal to Jews. But even these tools had already been anticipated early on within the Zionist movement. A good indication of these plans can be gleaned from the open declaration of Weizmann, who would ponder the matter early on in the wake of the Balfour Declaration. If Balfour relegated the Palestinian native majority in the country to the margins by referring to them as the non-Jewish communities, who, in his declar- who his declaration insisted would be safeguarded, and quote, that nothing shall be done which may prejudice their civil and religious rights, Weizmann followed suit in 1919 at the Paris Peace Conference, declaring, and I quote, that the Zionist objective was gradually to make Palestine as Jewish as England was English. In 1924, Ben-Gurion, the leader of the Jewish colonial settler community in Palestine, clarified what Weizmann had in mind when he explicitly stated with regards to, to, with regards to the period's increasingly popular right of self-determination that the Palestinians demanded that, and I quote him, the Arab community in the country has the right of self-determination, of self-rule. The national autonomy which we demand for ourselves, we demand for the Arabs as well but we do not admit their right to rule over the country to the extent that the country is not built up by them and still awaits those European European Jewish colonists who will work on it." In a 1930 letter to British Assistant Under Secretary of State, Weizmann himself used a similar logic when he affirmed that, quote, the rights that the Jewish people have been adjudged in Palestine by the British mandate do not depend on the consent and cannot be subject to the will of the majority of Palestine's present inhabitants. Indeed, Weizmann was clear that when the British promised the Zionists a national home in Palestine, quote, the agreement of the Palestinian Arabs was not asked. The reason that Palestinian consent was of no import, he added, was on account of the, quote, uniqueness of the Jewish connection to Palestine, which justified the Zionist fear of democracy. As for the Palestinians themselves, They could not, he said, quote, be considered as owning the country in the sense in which the inhabitants of Iraq or of Egypt possess their respective countries. To grant them self-determination or self-government or a legislative assembly would be to assign the country to its present inhabitants, he added. The horror. He he agreed that the Zionists would have no problem with the Palestinians being given self-governing powers over, quote, Arab education, hospitals, religious and cultural institutions for the Muslim and Christian communities, etc., unquote. but not over the future of the country or the Jewish colonial settlers, as this would contravene the racialist chauvinism of Zionism and its fear of democracy, which he had envisioned for Israel. But even this modicum of rights was far too generous for the Israeli state once it was established in May 1948. The first sovereign act the state took was to extend the British mandatory security security regulations, first enacted in 1937 against the Palestinian Arabs for the express purpose of, quote, the suppression of mutiny, rebellion, and riot, but which after 1945 were deployed under the appellation Defense Emergency Regulations against the Jewish colonists in order to quell massive anti-British Jewish terrorism during that period. The regulations effectively declared martial law in the country. They were so draconian that Yaakov Shapira of the Jewish Bar Association in Palestine and future Israeli Attorney General and Minister of Justice declared in February 1946 that, quote, even Nazi Germany did not have such laws and that no government is entitled to enact legislation of this kind, unquote. But out of fear of universal democracy and for the purpose of ensuring racial and religious privileges for Jews, Israel adopted the British emergency regulations for use against the remainder of the Palestinian people whom it could not expel and had to accept as unequal Israeli citizens. The regulations were the legal basis of the military government that the Israeli state imposed on its Palestinian citizens from 1948 to 1966, and again for a short period, in 1967, and were also the basis for its military occupation of the West Bank and Gaza. After the establishment of Israel, the country, as a good number of you know, legislated upwards of 65 laws that ensure Jewish legal privileges and discriminate against non-Jewish citizens. Half of these laws were legislated after the year 2000. These include, 
The early laws include, of course, the law of return of 1950, the law of absentee property, also the same year, the law of the state's property of 1951, the law of citizenship of 1952, the Israel Lands Administration Law of 1960, the Construction and Building Law of 1965, more recent laws include the 2003 temporary law banning spouses of Palestinian citizens of Israel who hail from the occupied territories from immigrating to Israel or acquiring Israeli citizenship. The 2018 nation state law, about which I will have more to say on the first panel, is more of the crowning effort of these laws rather than a deviation from them. For any racially exclusivist and supremacist movement, demographics are an essential element. As we saw, the project of emptying Palestine of its native Arab population was the declared goal of the Zionist colonial settler movement since its inception. However, its inability to fully execute this plan necessitated these anti-democratic measures. It is this failure that has forced the state of Israel to innovate solutions to ensure that while the Jewish state was not free of Palestinian Arabs, it is not Arab Ghain, the latter, by definition, would never threaten Jewish supremacist rights in the country. Indeed, prominent Israeli Jewish historian Benny Morris put it this way when I debated him on this question more than a decade, a decade and a half ago. He said, Israelis, Zionists, throughout the history of Zionism would have much preferred Palestine to be empty of Arabs, with therefore no need for Jews to be supremacist over anybody. Unquote. Fear of universal democracy would be best articulated by Israel's able foreign minister, Abba Ibn, born in South Africa under the name Aubrey Solomon, who expressed in a speech he gave on July 31st, 1972, at the 10th anniversary of the annual conference titled Dialogues, held in Israel and sponsored by the American Jewish Congress, which discussed whether one is better as a Jew if he, if he lives in the United States or in Israel, quote unquote. That was the topic. Abba Ibn's speech addressed Israel's fears of losing racial and religious supremacist privileges. Like today's Western pro-Zionists and Israeli apologists, Abba Ibn was most concerned about the possibility of equality and democracy in Israel, something that he opposed wholeheartedly. As objections to Israel's commitment against democracy increased in some circles of the American and European left in the early 1970s, Ibn put forth a most ingenious response. His strategy to combat these criticisms, like that of Israeli leaders then and now, was to identify objections to Israel's antipathy to universal democracy and to calls for equality and the end of racialized rule as nothing short of rabid anti-Semitism. In his 1972 speech to the American Jewish Congress, even sketched the strategy and the rudiments for the future propaganda campaign Israel set in motion. He declared, and this was part of his concern about the future, in 1990, this is in 1972 speaking, in 1990, if we take the Israel before 1967 with Jerusalem, that area will have 4 million Jews and 900,000 Arabs. But if we look at the situation in 1990 within the present ceasefire lines, then according to the statistical evidence that our cabinet has received and which has in any case been published, there will be an immigration of at least 500,000 Jews for every year, sorry, 50,000 Jews for every year until then. Of that 6.7 million or 7.5 million Jews, there will be, or Israelis, there will be 40 to 43 percent Arabs. The destiny of such a society will not be the subject of Jewish decisions because a 40% Arab minority will in effect constitute a majority because our 60% Jewish population is a pluralistic population. It reaches its decision by controversy, not by consensus. Therefore, on any issue on which Jews are divided, the Arabs will decide. If we decide on a unitary state, there will have to be free and equal rights. Whatever you say of that society, it will not be Jewish." Unquote. Eben's propaganda strategy was clear in his speech. He affirmed, and I quote, that recently we have witnessed the rise of the new left, which identifies Israel with the establishment, with acquisition and smug satisfaction, with in fact all the basic enemies against which its assault is waged. Let there be no mistake, the new left is the author and the progenitor of the new anti-Semitism. 
One of the chief tasks of any dialogue with the Gentile world is to prove that the distinction between anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism is not a distinction at all. You're probably familiar with this argument more recently. Anti-Zionism is merely the new anti-Semitism, he declared. And I continue with his words. The old classic anti-Semitism declared that equal rights belong to all individuals within a society except the Jews. The new anti-Semitism says that the right to establish and maintain an independent national sovereign state is the prerogative of all nations so long as they happen not to be Jewish. Thus, the denial by the new left and others of Israel's right to its national identity becomes anti-Semitic. Even sphere of democracy manifested in his insistence that Israel should be and should remain a racialized state that grants differential rights and privileges to Jews over non-Jews. Clearly, racist talk about the demographic threat that the Palestinians constitute for a Jewish supremacist Israel is not limited to the right-wing uh, uh, Israelis and, or the Israeli, Jew, the Israeli Jewish right-wing more generally, who have garnered majority support among Israeli Jews for many decades, but are also voiced by liberal and leftist Israeli Jews, as the Abba Ibn speech clearly demonstrated. Following Ibn's concerns, in December 2000, the Institute of Policy and Strategy at the Herzliya Interdisciplinary Center in Israel held its first of a projected series of annual conferences dealing with the strength and security of Israel, especially with regards to maintaining its Jewish supremacist character. The main points identified in its report was the concern over the numbers needed to maintain Jewish supremacy in the country. Quote, the high birth rate of Palestinian citizens of Israel brings into question the future of Israel as a Jewish state. The present demographic trends, should they continue, challenge the future of Israel as a Jewish state. Israel has two alternative strategies, adaptation or containment. The latter requires a long-term energetic Zionist demographic policy whose political, economic, and educational effects would guarantee the Jewish character of Israel, unquote. The report added that those who support the preservation of Israel's character as a Jewish state for the Jewish nation constitute, and I quote, a majority among the Jewish population in Israel. They're not wrong. The conference was not a lonely effort. None other than Israel's then president, Moshe Katsav, welcomed the attendees. Reflecting the predominant Jewish supremacist views among Israeli, pro-Israeli, and, pro -American, and American pro-Israeli Jews, the conference was co-sponsored by the American Jewish Committee, the Israel Center for Social and Economic Progress, the Israel Defense Ministry, the Jewish Agency, the World Zionist Organization, the National Security Center at Haifa University, the Israel National Security Council of the Prime Minister's Office. Suffice it to say, there was a consensus supporting this conference. It was not an oddity. The conference featured 50 speakers, including senior government and military officials, including ex and future prime ministers of Israel, university professors, business and media personalities, as well as American Jewish academics and operatives of the US-based pro-Israel lobby. All expressed their foundational fear of democracy and their commitment to preventing its realization in Israel. In 2001, Shimon Peres, largely considered the dove of official Israel, also worried about the Palestinian demographic danger, as he put it, especially as the green line which separated Israel, as he put it, from the West Bank, was beginning to disappear, which may lead to the linking of the futures of the West Bank Palestinians with Israeli Arabs, unquote. He hoped that the arrival of 100,000 Jews in Israel would postpone this demographic danger for 10 more years, as ultimately he stressed, and I quote him, demography will defeat geography, unquote. But there were no 100,000 Jews ready to come to Israel. Such support as Perez's for Jewish supremacy echoes the concerns of Golda Meir, who could not sleep in the early 1970s, as she put it once, horrified at the number of Palestinians born and conceived every night. <laughs> in 2007, Tsipi Livni, then Israeli foreign minister, was most explicit about her plans for Palestinian citizens of Israel. She stated that the alleged Palestinian state to be established will not be a solution just for the Palestinians who live in Judea and Samaria. It is designed to provide a comprehensive national solution even for the Palestinian citizens of Israel. It was a call for expulsion, of course. 
Prime Minister Netanyahu's recent declaration a couple of weeks ago that Israel is not a state of its own citizens, but a state of Jews worldwide, is therefore not incongruent with or a deviation from Zionist and Israeli plans and policies towards Palestinian citizens of Israel, but is fully consonant with them. His identification of Palestinians as a demographic bomb to a democracy-hating state of Israel is only the latest in a stream of Israeli and Zionist antipathy to democracy, as I've shown you. Often this is all said as if this is a surprise, this is something new, it is anything but. As fear of democracy has been a core principle of the Zionist movement and the state of Israel since the late 19th century, the two-pronged strategy they followed to prevent universal democracy has been primarily the expulsion of the population in the hope of making the country exclusively Jewish and free of Arabs, or failing which they would secondarily institute laws to preserve Jewish racial and religious and colonial privileges to the detriment of universal democracy. As expulsion of the majority of the Palestinians in the 1947 to 1949 period led to the establishment of a Jewish demographic majority that could pose as democratic to itself and to the world, the inability of Israel to expel the majority of the Palestinians of today, despite its expulsion of hundreds of thousands of Palestinians and Syrians during the 1967 invasion of Egypt, Syria, and Jordan, but despite the, its inability to expel the majority of the Palestinians today, an inability that has resulted in Jews becoming a demographic minority again in the country, has meant that the democratic pretense will have to be dropped once and for all. The nation state law was engineered with this reality in mind and with Israeli official acknowledgement that Israel's current situation of having a Jewish demographic minority is a permanent situation that cannot be easily changed. Based on this sober assessment, Israel and its policymakers enshrined articles in the new law to ensure Jewish supremacy in the country, regardless of the number of Jews who live there. The recent fear expressed by pro-Israel Western supporters that the Israeli right wing is changing the nature of Israel turns out to be unfounded in its entirety. Israel and Zionism have not changed nor has their opposition and antipathy to democracy changed at all. Rather, it is Israel's ability, but not its desire, just its ability to change the demography of the country through expulsions that has become more constrained. As for the reality on the ground for Israel's Palestinian citizens, let alone those who live in its occupied and besieged territories, it is the same old legalized racism and the same old apartheid that has reigned in the country without respite since its establishment in 1948. The category that the Israeli state invented for a large number of Palestinian citizens in the late 1940s as present absentees is actually one that fits perfectly its fabricated claim of democracy, a claim that is present in Israeli propaganda and fully absent in Israeli law. Thank you.